Good evening, Los Angeles, and thank you for joining us tonight as we update you on our work to make this a safer and healthier city for all Los Angeles residents. Before we get to tonight's important announcement about public safety, I want to very briefly update you on COVID-19. And tonight is a bittersweet mix of good news and bad news. And you'll forgive me if I start with the good news first. First, our numbers are holding. Your work is working. And we're seeing the curve bending down again. This is fragile. These recoveries and these statistics can change day to day. But all of you who are wearing masks and washing hands and surfaces, keeping your distance and not gathering between households, are having an impact of saving lives. And for that, I thank you. Today, the county reported 2,039 new cases, bringing the total in LA County to now 176,028. 905 of those were here in the city of Los Angeles, and the county also, and most sadly, reported 17 deaths, bringing our total of fallen Angelinos to 4,700, sorry, 4,375. Our hospitalizations are still high, but we have the capacity to withstand them. 2,051 people are currently hospitalized, and in the, across the county there are 547 available ba beds, including 451 acute care beds and 96 ICU beds, as well as an inventory of 1,105 available ventilators. The fact is, though, COVID-19 is still in control. So we have to fight with everything we have to wrest control back from COVID-19, to keep pushing those numbers down. This is a make or break work week for COVID-19 in the County of Los Angeles. Our public health conditions remain fragile, but the COVID threat level remains at orange. And we currently have enough hospital beds, including ICU beds, to manage the city's COVID-19 and other health needs. So we are not moving to red, we are not closing any additional businesses or activities. And to keep moving in that right direction, keep doing your part. Keep wearing that mask. Keep keeping that distance. Stay at home whenever you can and help us save more lives. But here's the bad news. This disease is still killing too many people. As you heard me talk about on Friday, we lost a member of the Los Angeles Police Department, Valentin Val Martinez who died of complications due to COVID-19. He was about to be a father to twins. He leaves behind a family and loved ones who grieve his absence every minute of every day. And over the weekend, the news got even worse for our city family, as we learned that the virus had taken from us LAFD firefighter and paramedic Jose Perez, 44 years of age, with each three children between four and 14. To his family, too, we mourn and we are heartbroken. And I speak for all Angelinos when I say that we send love to their families, that your service, that your sacrifice will never be forgotten. And we lost one more angel, Gabby O'Donnell. Gabby was the mother of a dear friend of mine and brother mayor, Robert Garcia of Long Beach. She was an immigrant to this country from Peru who worked until recently as a health worker in the midst of this pandemic. And we thought she was getting better, but she took a turn for the worse this morning and succumbed to COVID-19. Her husband, Mayor Garcia's stepfather, remains in the hospital fighting this disease. Three frontline workers and three angels who are fallen. I would ask you all to hold Mayor Garcia and his family and the family of our firefighter and police officer in your thoughts and prayers tonight. And for all of you who have lost somebody, we hold you as well. We're fighting against this disease as we also continue the battle against the inequities that this virus has laid bare. This weekend, I was in Nickerson Gardens with the actor and activist Anthony Anderson, who grew up, was born and grew up in Nickerson. This is part of Los Angeles' commitment to equity of access to tests, to bring tests to where people are and to save lives. But long before COVID-19, we had a public health emergency in those neighborhoods of crime and death and violence. We saw in a city that had more than 1,000 homicides in a single year, and violence as always concentrated in communities bypassed for decades, starved of resources, 
filled with gun violence, and the old models were not working. We started in Jordan Downs and moved to Imperial, Nickerson, San Fernando Gardens. Public housing developments, some of the largest, in fact, one of them is the largest west of the Mississippi, to begin saying we had to develop together a better way to protect life and to give opportunity to young people growing up there. Well, just like then, this is one of those moments that demands that each one of us do more. As many cities around the country struggle to figure out how to connect public safety and communities together, we draw from a reservoir here in Los Angeles of programs and policies that have been leading in the nation. We have a lot more to do, but tonight is about taking those accelerated steps forward that can continue to not only save lives, but make sure that we have co-ownership of public safety, from community members to police officers and everyone in between. We have in Los Angeles a public safety model that makes people safe wherever they are, and our goal is to make sure in all communities. It's the kind of success that we've seen with the Community Safety Partnership, with the Gang Reduction and Youth Development Programs, that ask for co-ownership of public safety. Don't just put that on the shoulder of police officers, but who ask each one of us to plan and to own what public safety looks like in Los Angeles. So today we take a big step forward in building on that success to ensure equity and justice and fairness for every Angelino by creating the Community Safety Partnership Bureau in the Los Angeles Police Department, named after our nationally recognized initiative that puts officers on five-year assignments in one place to develop relationships with the people that they serve so that police officers and community members know each other's names, so that they can sit down together and talk about their neighborhood, so that a police officer looks at her assignment not as an assignment anymore, but her opportunity to join the fabric of a neighborhood. I'm so grateful to the leaders, some of who you can see and some because of COVID-19 are safely socially distanced, but whom you'll hear from tonight, who are the mothers and fathers of this program and who are now responsible for its expansion and success. This new bureau makes CSP both a program and a philosophy. In other words, it is a set of policies and procedures and people, but is also an approach to how we police. As you'll hear, I'm sure, from Connie Rice, and as you read in the LA Times maybe today about moving from a warrior mentality to a guardian mentality. But it isn't just about the police officers. It's about the community as well. We want every Angelino to feel secure, not only in the parks and the streets of their neighborhoods, but in the presence of those in uniform. And we want all officers to feel connected to the people they protect, and we all want a safer Los Angeles. Since its expansion to six new sites during my time as your mayor, CSP has delivered that not just to public housing developments, but now into neighborhoods as well, outside of the campuses of, of uh, public housing. And today, we have data to back up its success. You'll hear, but UCLA found that more than 220 violent crimes were prevented in CSP zones in over a five-year period. That's 220 murders and aggravated assaults and other violent crimes that didn't happen, that didn't devastate the lives and families of Angelinos. But more than statistics, CSP built relationships that have changed and saved lives. Police officers became mentors who influenced the direction of young people. We're here in the Tom Bradley Ballroom, and some of you have heard, but maybe many of you out there on television tonight haven't heard the story of my grandfather, who was a Mexican immigrant to this city, who got into trouble as a young man, and who was arrested by an LAPD officer who gave him a second chance. That LAPD officer was none other than Tom Bradley, who went on to become the mayor of this city, and for whom this, the highest room in this building, is named after. I don't believe I would be here today as your mayor had there not been that sort of a relationship between a young man and a police officer that changed our lives forever. CSP is doing that sort of work every single day, and the results? Less crime with fewer arrests and greater trust. What's not to love in that list? Together with the incredible city and law enforcement and civil rights and community and academic leaders here tonight, we're taking this step for a clear reason to build on our leadership in 21st century law enforcement, rooted in, greater, rooted in greater accountability and transparency and relationship-based policing. And we see these principles in action. 
Today, LAPD is one of the largest departments in the country to not only have body cameras on patrol officers and train its officers in de-escalation and implicit bias that helped us cut fatal police shootings in half, and today we're 82nd out of 100 of the biggest cities in America when it comes to fatalities at the hands of police. But two weeks ago, we dramatically built upon that as the police commission passed some of the nation leading reforms around use of force to become fully compliant with eight can't wait. I wish it had gotten more coverage in the paper. Tens of thousands of people have been out on the streets demanding that sort of change. And yet, when it happened, we didn't hear much about it. But I want you to know that it happened. And we've expanded the area covered by our gang reduction and youth development programs by over 50%, a much bigger expansion than anything inside this police department. A step that reduced juvenile arrests, helped our police officers have crimes that are prevented before they happen, and interventionists to work on de-escalation. We all have to own this moment. I'm struggling with how we describe this new paradigm, but I think it's community-driven policing. It is about the co-ownership of public safety, not just by a police department, but by all of us, and a feeling that we own that mission. That's why we're creating this new bureau, to expand on a proven model, to embed this strictly into the culture of this department, and to make sure that we find those best practices and share them with every corner of this department, to institutionalize an approach and to integrate the CSP training and curriculum across the department. Because when our officers understand the experiences of the people that they serve, they are more effective at doing the hard work they took an oath to do. And when Angelinos, especially in our black and Latino neighborhoods, trust the police officers assigned to serve them, they feel and they are safer. None of this is happening in isolation. This is part of a wider strategy of reducing force through tactics and training and the recruitment, changing cultures where we have to, as well as looking beyond policing at the way that inequities on wealth and health and education have taken African Americans in this city and poor people and folks of color across Los Angeles to a starting line far behind where others start their lives. And I'm so pleased to serve with the most progressive city council in the United States of America, where leaders have stepped forward to say, it is not time for others to lead and we will follow. We want to be at the front of that line. Not a moment to pander, but a moment to ponder, and a moment to figure out how to get this right. Luckily, we're building from a foundation. So we're taking CSP from a core pillar of this department to part of the foundation of the Los Angeles Police Department in the future. We're always learning. We need to stay humble. We need to hear where we fall short. But we have to keep demanding more and better. This is a product of trust and cooperation, a result of community and partnership and personal relationships. This is the settings where communities can co-create public safety along law enforcement. And through CSP, through our LAPD, through every program and policy de we deploy, these are the values this moment demands, so we don't just miss this moment, but we need it. And I have no doubt that we will, and that's because of the leaders around me. So let me shut up and turn it over to the first one of them to speak. And we've got a marquee group, but we're so pleased to first start with Councilmember Monica Rodriguez, who chairs our Public Safety Committee on the Los Angeles City Council. She brings a deep understanding of the importance and the value of, com of the community safety partnership at the table as the newest area in our city where a community safety partnership is being put forward. In the San Fernando Gardens CSP, earlier this year I was with her as we rolled that out. I know how much she loves her district, I know how much she loves the city, and I know what a strong leader she is in this moment that demands it. So with that, I'm gonna spray the microphone and hand it over to her. Thank you, Mayor. Public service is a privilege. Whether folks are elected or sworn, our city and cities across the nation deserve governance and leaders that they trust. Trust is a fundamental part of what we need to make sure that members of our community have when it comes to their Los Angeles Police Department. We find ourselves in this moment rightfully impatient angry about what we've seen unfold across this country. But what I'm most proud of is that the response here has been one to adapt and change and embrace and hear what changes need to be delivered here in the city of Los Angeles. 
This department is no stranger to evolution. It's one that has continued to address where it has failed. And I'm proud that in this moment of memorializing what is going to be a core value of this department, understanding that trust is not just given, it is earned. And that is a fundamental part of the CSP program. I couldn't be more proud that today as we are launching and announcing the Bureau for the Community Safety Partnership, that it will be led by none other than an individual that has so remarkably led in her, by her own example, Amata Tangarides, as the Deputy Chief of this Bureau. She has a long earned reputation of helping to build community trust. And it is with that shared responsibility that we will continue to make our greatest strides forward in the city of Los Angeles, working in a shared responsibility together with our residents to create communi community policing models that work. Because together we will achieve our highest and greatest outcomes in public safety when we work together. As the mayor mentioned earlier this year, uh, together we announced and, and launched the Community Safety Partnership for the first time in the San Fernando Valley, in my district, in Pacoima, in the San Fernando Gardens. And it was through that shared design, working with the community members, working with our Los Angeles Police Department to help identify the officers that would be assigned to the San Fernando Gardens. We worked collaboratively to help make sure that the programmatic response wasn't one that was uh, just slapped on from another area. It was one that was organically built with members of the community. And it is through those types of collaborative efforts, it is through the increased funding for youth programming that we will continue to make improved strides in having a safer city here in Los Angeles and having a police department and the relationships amongst those that are elected and sworn, the trust that is earned and deserved for all Angelinos in our city. I'm really proud that we will continue to make these great advancements and look forward to our continued and shared work that we will lead as a city collaboratively. And again, I wanna give my sincerest congratulations to Amada Tingarides on this phenomenal role that she will play in helping to shape community policing throughout the city of Los Angeles. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson, for remarks. Uh, big props to our mayor, who's always up to the job, even if it's uh, scrubbing down the microphone and podium. Um, I, I just want to join the course of uh, speakers today. There, there are a few of us who are here to really uh, celebrate the work of the Los Angeles Police Department in this regard uh, and thank our, our mayor and our leadership on our council for pushing forward this innovation um, even further than I think anybody could have mad imagined. When I got on the council in 2015, I had a meeting in the big shiny building over there uh, chief and the chief Beck said to you, said to me you want an election what do you want and I said I want to do community partnership in a neighborhood in my district and I didn't have any housing developments in my district and those programs historically have been supported by uh, some financial support from the the federal government I said let's figure out uh, how to do it and so shortly after that I get a call from the Tingarides there were two of them on the force at that time uh, and, and now there's uh, one, and they said, let's figure it out. In the Harvard Park neighborhood, there had been dozens of shootings, uh, six homicides in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, we worked the community safety partnership uh, in that neighborhood, and after a year and a half of being there, reduced the homicide number to zero. Uh, reduced the shooting number uh, dramatically without increasing arrest and without the attendant, which I've experienced all too often, without the attendant increase of clashes between the community and police. I represent a district where a lot of times when things happen in the neighborhood, people don't want to call the police. They want something done, but they're afraid to call the police because they're afraid of what might happen. 
now in the Harvard Park neighborhood, because this is relationship-based policing, now people feel like I can walk down the block to the park and talk to an officer that I know by name, who I know was here last week and the month before and will be here a month later. And they, uh, when they act, they will act in the way that a member of the community would react and a member of the community would use their uh, power. And so we've seen uh, great success there and we like to think of ourselves in Harvard Park uh, chief as the guinea pigs to demonstrate that it could work uh, outside, of, uh, outside of our district. And so I know uh, Council Member Buscaino, uh, I'm very grateful to you as well because it was residents in my district who lived on the border of Watts who said, we want a relationship with the police officers the way they have in Jordan Downs and in, in, in the projects. And so they provided testimony to people who were a little bit skeptical in the beginning. And so we thank you for your support and, and certainly uh, Councilman Price uh, for bringing it into the 9th District. I, for one, will say this is the only way that I've seen in a systematic way where you can do policing in communities like South Los Angeles, where the community feels like the police department works on their behalf. I'll say that again. The community believes that these police officers work on their behalf, and they are not interveners or interlopers in a community. They're part of the community. They're part of the fabric, and they're there to help prevent problems and to help solve them uh, when they arrive. So uh, congratulations uh, again to Chief Moore and our new Deputy Chief, uh, Amata Tingarides. And uh, uh, before I leave the stage, I cannot do so without recognizing Connie Rice, uh, who's, who, yes, deserves a round of applause. There are people in here and they're clapping for Connie Rice, uh, um, who has uh, dedicated uh, her life uh, to reforming and building the kind of community policing that we need in every part of the city that will actually create safety uh, for our community from the negative forces in our community, but also uh, all too often uh, negative clashes between police and community. So again, thank you for all the work that you've done in this regards and, and congratulations for helping bring this day into existence. And thank you so much for your leadership, uh, Councilmember Harris Dawson. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Rodriguez, as well. And another one of the champions who has um, pushed this forward, and he knows a thing or two about being a police officer because that's what he was before and still is in the reserve component. Uh, but from the 15th Council District, which encompasses many of the campuses that include the Community Safety Partnership, please welcome Councilmember Joe Buscano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment to expand this well-known, effective community safety partnership program uh, citywide. I'm here today because uh, I believe it's the most important place at this moment in time uh, where I can find myself as a resident, at a city, as a city council member, as a former LAPD officer, now reserve officer, uh, with lived experience of community policing. Now, I joined the LAPD because I wanted to be an effective officer who embraced community-based policing. I've served a blessed 15 years. And for the last six years in the department, just prior to my election to council member, I was assigned to my own neighborhood in San Pedro as a senior lead officer, one of LAPD's two widely successful community policing programs. As you may know, senior lead officers work with individual residents, business owners, city and county departments and agencies to help solve complex problems that often require the assistance, cooperation, and coordination of all parties involved. And I know that many LA residents today love and rely on their senior lead officer. Again, community policing is the reason why I joined the Los Angeles Police Department. It's in my DNA. And I'm here to say that I believe our cops should be guardians, not warriors. I joined the department because I wanted to help people. I wanted to show the heart behind the badge and begin to change the culture of the LAPD that resulted in the beating of Rodney King. And in the last 25 years, I have watched the department transformed into one of mostly white officers to one that reflects the diversity of the city. Today, the LAPD is 70% women and people of color. 70%. And I saw how the consent decree in 
federal oversight following the Rampart scandal improved the department and, and made it a more accountable to the public. Let's let it be known that LAPD has done an incredible job of transforming into a, a more, more diverse, accountable, and professional department. But the work is never done. For the entirety of my time as council member, as the mayor alluded to, we've been piloting the community safety partnership in my district in Watts. Senior lead officers and the community safety partnership are community policing models where police officers are guardians of their communities. The CSP program recently underwent a rigorous evaluation from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, in which my dear friend Dr. Georgia Leap will speak on shortly. I'll let her get into the specifics, but the results were clear. Now, though not perfect, the CSP program has reduced and made crime and made residents feel a lot safer. And to give you a real world example on how CSP has been effective, Allow me to read from the 2015 New York Times story profiling the Community Safety Partnership in Watts. I quote, Donnie Jobert watched the boy round the corner of the housing project holding what looked like a handgun. The barrel was pointed at him and the two officers from the Los Angeles Police Department. The boy was 10 or 11 years old, Mr. Jobert figured, and had more gleam than anger in his eyes. Mr. Jobert, a community activist who grew up in the project shouted and lunged for the gun. It was plastic. The police officers didn't even reach for their holsters. Somewhere else, Mr. Jobert said, that kid would have been dead." End quote. Now the Community Safety Partnership Program has drastically improved the quality of life in Watts and now the LAPD has expand, will expand that success into other neighborhoods in Los Angeles under the, the guiding, guidance and care of one of my former senior lead officer colleagues, soon to be Deputy Chief Amada Tingridis. We're so proud of you, Amada. Half the entire Watts community, we are so proud of you. We love you, and we know CSP will be in good care. But this is not a light switch. The Community Safety Partnership is about building real relationships, real, real relationships of trust. As Connie Rice says trust is the greatest tool to battle crime. The most critical components to community policing take time. The CSP program did not start to, to show results up until three years. And this is why we need to be extremely cautious as we continue having the conversation of dismantling police resources. Any dismantling will most affect those already underserved neighborhoods that have to deal with crime and gang activity on a regular basis. Let it be known that there are dangerous people operating on our streets. These people have not suddenly gone away. Yes, we need to invest more on the front end with funding for education, more mental health and housing, but it's equally true that we need to invest, not divest in key police resources like the Community Safety Partnership. Now, there are many residents of Los Angeles who ask for and rely on police resources and expect the department to answer when they call 911. Policing is a conversation that requires much more nuance than we've contributed thus far. Historically, most of my colleagues have been very, very supportive of the Community Safety Partnership, as you've heard. So I'm very happy that we're all here celebrating this, the expansion. But CSP cops, they're more than regular patrol officers, so it's tough to both defund and expand at the same time. Watts has legitimately changed for the positive over the past eight years and we've been piloting the Community Safety Partnership, and today is the first day of building those relationships throughout the rest of the city. We all must remain committed. We must all remain committed to nothing short of a complete transformation of LAPD into a department of guardians, not warriors. To that end, I want to conclude by leaning on our mayor, calling on the police commission and the chief to consider assigning all new probationary officers to the Community Safety Partnership Bureau uh, upon graduating from the police academy so that community policing becomes part of the DNA of every new LAPD officer. With that, help me welcome from the new ninth, I don't know if it's so new anymore, with your leadership, council member, Curran Price.
Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Buscano, for that, uh, for that introduction. You know, as we continue to re-envision public safety and the role that our police department plays, uh, we need to be thinking forward when it comes to how we are protecting and serving the city of Los Angeles. We're living during a pivotal time in our history, and the landscape of our community is changing right before our eyes. We can no longer go by the old way of thinking, and we must change our approach, which is why we're re-examining the need for armed law enforcement in such instances as traffic stops or service calls surrounding homelessness uh, or when people uh, suffering from substance abuse uh, and neighbor complaints. We're in the middle of a modern day civil rights movement and our citizens have made their voices heard. We're being urged to funnel the attention and resources where they're needed the most uh, as we continue to restructure. We know for certain that we need to find ways to heal and reestablish trust between Angelinos and the police officers. And a great way to do it is through the Community Safety, Safety Partnership Program. I've seen firsthand the positive effects that this community policing model has played in my district. CSP programs are crucial in communities like mine where one out of three constituents are under the age of 18. In April of 2019, we launched the CSP program in South Park one of the oldest and most historic parks in the city. In its heyday, some of you may recall, South Park was a, a sprawling oasis in South LA. Unfortunately, through the years, this community jewel has lost its luster. I'm proud to report that the South Park CSB has been a great case study of rebuilding relationships between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. At South Park, the CSB program brought much needed resources and programming and safety to the area, as well as strengthening ties and working together to reduce crime and build safe, thriving neighborhoods. CSPs are, have, are proven to be a bridge to bridge those divides and to build mutual respect. The 10 officers there have become part of the extended South Park family and have ushered in a new and improved South Park. To give you some background, the 120 plus year or so old park has been undergoing a renaissance over the past several years. And while attention has been going to improving the infrastructure and the aesthetics, uh, we kept hearing that, that South Park was still unsafe. Over the past year, the CSP has changed the perception and reputation of this beloved park dramatically, breathing new life into it. Today, the park is safe as a space where our families can build memories and our children can run freely. This community-based policing has not only focused on reducing crime and gang activity, but it also carries out enriching activities that allow our children and families to prosper. Programs such as food, toys, shoe giveaways, women's self-defense classes, know your rights seminars, financial literacy, raising awareness on drugs, alcohol, gangs, and other uh, youth mentorship instruction. Prior, just prior to the, to, the, to the coronavirus outbreak, South Park CSP was involved with 155 youth programming events, 155, which included football, basketball, volleyball, soccer clinics, uh, boxing, and many other activities. They also led field trips to destinations like Dodger Stadium, Universal Studios, the Kids uh, Space Museum, uh, Hermosa Beach, bag riding, and other excursions. In all, they engaged with tens of thousands of community members, including adults and children, in the span of just 12 months. South Park, under the watchful eye of Sergeant uh, Ronald Kingji, who was raised in CD9 and spent uh, most of his time playing in South Park, uh, it's returning to its glory days. I'm proud to say this model has been highly effective in lowering crime through positive interaction with the police. And the residents have not only welcomed the program with open arms, but they've taken ownership in the park and in their neighborhoods. Just as importantly, overall crimes have decreased in, this, in the area where CSP has been implemented. While South Park is but one example, the program has also proven successful at public housing communities in CD9, which include Pueblo del Rio and Avalon Gardens. So I want to thank Mayor Garcetti and Chief Moore 
for realizing the value of pilot programs like CSP, which uplift community members and effectively fortifies safer neighborhoods. Expanding the program citywide and establishing a new CSP bureau will help enrich the city by laying the foundation for creating long-lasting relationships within communities all over LA, and that's really what we want to see. Uh, like my colleagues, I'm enthusiastic to see the effects that this program is going to have uh, across this city under the direction of Deputy Chief Nevada Tendrinis and her team. All of us believe uh, in the importance of building bridges and collaborating with neighbors to create healthy communities and to fight crime. The steps we're taking today demonstrate a renewed commitment to putting the needs of our communities first and our willingness to reimagine the future policing by taking action now. We know it's going to take time. Uh, we know it's going to be a great effort. But we also know that we're moving forward with, with solutions that can work. And folks, this is really just the beginning. So it's now my honor to uh, introduce a person who has got a 40 plus year commitment to our community uh, to protect and to serve our Chief of Police, Chief Michael Moore. So um, good evening, everyone. I've got a number of thank yous, so I'm going to ask for your patience for a moment. First, Mayor Garcetti, thank you for your continued leadership of the city. To Council Members Rodriguez, Harris Dawson, Busciano, and Councilman Price, thank you as well. Whether it be public safety or the new ninth or any of the other uh, districts that you represent, you, you represent progress. You represent commitment to public safety. And today, you represent the continued support not only of this program, but it's this transformational moment. I also want to extend my thanks and appreciation, my gratitude to Professor Georgia Leap and her team at UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Georgia, your year-long study and evaluation of the Community Safety Partnership was comprehensive, it was fair, and it, set, and it set out a roadmap for the future of not only the CSP program, but how the powerful dynamics of this model can be institutionalized across all aspects of the department. Now this study is, is, would not have been uh, available had we not had the generosity of the Bomber Group, the California Endowment, Rick Caruso, Cindy Miskinkowski, the Smith Foundation, and the Weingart Foundation. Their financial commitment allowed this study to be possible. The criticality of this study is that in the nine sites that, are, that began in 2011 and built up through with the latest establishment in the San Fernando Gardens, there were questions. Would this work? Did it matter? Was crime really down and was trust really up? And without an academic study, we wouldn't have those answers. We'd have anecdotal stories. But this moment is also important to me because in my appointment more than two years ago, I talked about reinventing, reimagining, and renewing. That this was an organization that had seen great success with the early founders of the CSP program, Chief Charlie Beck, Ms. Connie Rice, Ms. Susan Lee, the Housing Authority, the Mayor's Gang Reduction and Youth Development, and Phil and Amata Tangerides. But as I started my new chapter with this organization, I recognized that their vision years ago of what was possible by challenging the status quo of policing needed the next chapter. The study has provided for that and has demonstrated that envisioning a violence reduction and community safety strategy that builds on trust and that's relationship-based partnerships over over traditional policing matters. And as has been said, in Los Angeles here today, as well as across America, policing stands at a critical juncture. We recognize that relationships with our community, particularly in the black and brown communities, must improve. Today's announcement is that next step in reimagining in the co-creation of public safety here in Los Angeles. It's what I started in my remarks as taking my position was to see the expansion of the CSP program. And the study has allowed us to not just demonstrate that it can reduce crime and improve trust, but that it's ready for the next step. But as it talked about the success, about the fewer instances of violent crime, about the community members that were asking for, the, for, the, for this program to be sustained, we also saw that it had its own problems, its own flaws. As a grassroots effort, there were several areas that the department needed to recalibrate. 
how it would support the program, how would we oversee its operations, and how it would remain responsive to the community needs. Councilman Price, I think, said it best when we look at South Park, a series of programming that in the last year has tremendous, has improved the trust of the policing officer, the police officers that are there, and the safety. But what we look at across nine sites is how does that programming ensure that trust is being built and is not just programming for the sense of programming. As we looked across this, the varying stages of these sites, we saw that a centralized leadership was needed to ensure the day-to-day -day fidelity to the model. I believe the establishment of a Community Safety Partnership Bureau, including the appointment of a Deputy Chief and Civilian Commanding Officer, provides that necessary breadth of leadership to improve the fidelity to the model, as well as to integrate it into our culture. And let me say clearly, Captain Amada Tangaridis, Promoting her to the position of Deputy Chief over the Community Safety Partnership Bureau is one of the most critical decisions I have made for the future of this department. In making that appointment, in choosing her for this critical moment, it wasn't that she was a face of CSP since its inception. It wasn't that she grew up in the Watts community. Both these circumstances are true, but you only need to spend a few moments with her to understand her, her empathy how the interrelationship between culture, demographics, and economic factors that impact so many neighborhoods across Los Angeles, not just our housing developments, but neighborhoods all across this great city, are benefited by, by that sense of compassion, that sense of developing a relationship that is built on a genuine trust and engagement that the long-term efforts of policing and a shared responsibility of public safety benefits when we look at trust rather than arrests and citations. I also want this appointment to send a clear message that the department is committed to uplifting both women and people of color for positions of influence. Now the CSP success is also dependent on a more meaningful integration of community voices. As we look across our nine sites, we recognize today that we have work to do with a number of those, a number of those communities. Work in a sense of a genuine engagement and a specific safety strategy plan for moving forward for that next stage, that next sense of success in those communities. So in closing, this model represents a pivot, if you will, a strategy of moving ourselves away from a containment and suppression model to one that has increased community capacity, a sense of overall safety, where you see the lower levels of crime in concert with lower number of arrests, but increased trust. The person who's going to lead that next chapter along with two commanding officers that are here that I want to recognize, Captain Billy Brockway and Captain Giselle Espinoza, thank you and congratulations on your appointments. Is this next woman the future of the Community Safety Partnership Bureau? And I'd like to introduce Captain, but soon to be, Deputy Chief Amada Tangaridis. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got on the job. I got so excited. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for your presence. I want to first start off by recognizing and thanking Chief Moore for this decision. I don't take it lightly. He understands the direction that policing needs to take in this time and I couldn't be more honored to do this, Chief. Thank you so much. I also want to thank the council districts. Every single council district that I heard today, there's a CSP officer that's really built relationships within your districts. Just in a short time in San Fernando Gardens, I've heard countless stories about relationships that have grown with families, with individuals, with businesses throughout the San Fernando Valley. Thank you so much for your support in that. When we stood up the Community Safety Partnership Program, one of the things that was key to it all was to not have the word police in the title of it. This isn't an LAPD program. This is a community program. This is about understanding the cultures of the communities and adjusting how we work and respond to conflict within communities. 
It's about getting certain training for the officers, like gang intervention, having teenagers come to their training to explain to them why they fear the police, doing role play where the children and people from within the community feels what it's like to be a police officer and vice versa. It's that deep embedded understandings of culture and then responding to it because every community is different. The Community Safety Partnership Program is also very fragile. As we can see across the country, our nation right now, people are hurting. One of the important components of this program is the forgiveness. Understanding our history and what has occurred in the past and not being afraid to say I'm sorry and we recognize it, but to work together to change it. And that's what this program is about. I am so honored and looking forward to being the new deputy chief overseeing this bureau. There was a lot of talk today about the programming. There's a lot of narrative that police officers shouldn't be involved in programming. That should be school teachers, that should be schools, that should be nonprofit organizations. I cannot agree more. One of our signature programs, which was known as the Watts Bears, is now known as the Watts Rams. It's been taken over by the community. The coaches are still there, they're still participating in mentoring, but the Watts Rams organization, community volunteers, parents have taken ownership of that program and now that is a community program. There are a lot of programs right now throughout all of the districts where the community has taken over and it has been sustained within that community with just the support and the cheerleading by the CSP officers that are assigned to those areas. There was an article that was referred to today by Councilman Buscaino. I was standing in front of Nickerson Gardens gym that day. That officer in that article was myself. And I did see that young man turn the corner with that gun. And I didn't know if it was real or if it was plastic. But I too looked into the eyes of that young man and I saw fear. And I let that community member intervene and address that young man. And we had a conversation after. This program will only deepen the relationships that law enforcement officers across this city already do. I was a former senior lead officer. We have been embedded in the community's building relationships. We have gone through consent decree. We have gone through huge reform. This is our moment, like the mayor said. This is our opportunity to deepen this relationship across the city, and I couldn't be honored to take on this challenge. Thank you very much. I'm glad soon-to-be Deputy Chief Tangridis did not make the next introduction because I get to do it now, which is really if there is um, one mother or father uh, above all other equals here, uh, it has really been Connie Rice. Um, just on a personal level, I was asked, uh, Cindy, the LA Times asked me this before, like where, where did this all come from? Was this just the chief? Was this you? Um, look, without any one of the people here, this wouldn't have happened. But I can guarantee you, none of us would have had the idea for this and recognized the connection as strongly to this moment in pushing this forward were it not for the friendship and the brilliance of Connie Rice, who has gone into communities, great civil rights attorney, uh, but who has the conversations with the gang members and with the governors. She's somebody who doesn't care where you come from and isn't impressed no matter what, but she's not going to dismiss you no matter what mistakes you might have made in life. And it is that ethos that permeates why we are here. I want to thank her, congratulate her. She's going to be holding our feet to the fire tomorrow about what's wrong, about how we're setting this up. But that's the role that an advocate plays in the right way. And truly, uh, you are an angel in the city of angels. Please welcome Connie Rice. Thank you, Mayor Garcetti. I'll spend uh, the rest of the year earning that introduction. But thank you for your leadership, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to the council people, Councilwoman Rodriguez, Councilman Price, Councilman Buscaino, and especially, especially uh, uh, my partner in crime, uh, Councilman Harris Dawson. Thank you so much to the council. Uh, this is big, and in police world, this takes courage. A chief of police doesn't just get up 
can stand up a bureau for guardian policing. And for Chief Moore to do this, it sends a message across the country and at a time when it's risky for him to do so. So I want to thank the chief for having the courage to do this, and this is, this is big. Um, to uh, soon-to-be Deputy Chief Tingarides, if I could clone you, I'd get you down, to, I'd get you up to, 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 to Stanford and get you cloned. Um, it was your vision, your compassion, your empathy, your hair is on fire, and you breathe the soul into this program. Uh, you and the community together, because this is a partnership. It's a joint venture. It's a joint venture to improve the safety and the well-being of people who have never felt safe. We ended in this city a war on gangs and started a war on the trauma and the violence and the conditions that people suffer in. Too many people in this county don't ever feel safe. The vision of CSP is that you go after, you get everybody in the boat together, and you row. You row towards safety, you row toward empowerment, and you create the conditions, you create the conditions for safety and trust. This is about legitimacy. When Deputy Chief Tingariti said that it was, you started out with the history, and you, you apologize, that's truth and reconciliation. It's restoration. It's beginning anew. It's hitting reset. And to have the courage to do that. Well, four months later, I think that uh, Captain Tingarides then was surprised when the community members from the Watts Gang Task Force came back and said, you know, we have something to apologize for too. That was the reconciliation, and they've been off to the races ever since. I'll leave you with an anecdote that made me realize that we had done something that we didn't understand. We didn't understand how impactful this, this program was. Community members empowered to sit at the table with officers, analyze their community's dangers and community's assets. You know every kid, you know who's on medication, you know who isn't, you know who can't afford their prescription, you know who needs mental health help, you know who needs food stamps. You know the kid that was skipping school because he got bullied in the hallway? Well, you figure out how to do a wraparound around him, too. This is a wraparound safety strategy. It comes from public health. Officers don't want all that jargon. They just want to know they've got backup and that they're not being asked to solve every problem that we have failed to solve. This is the future of American policing. CSP was noted in President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. And I'll leave you with this anecdote before I, before I introduce the real Shiro here on, on, on this stage, outside from Captain, uh, Deputy Chief Tingarides. Uh, right after the Dorner uh, fiasco, uh, the officer who went on a killing spree of LAPD officers, Chief Bobby Green called me and he said, Connie, he's dead. I said, when's the last time you slept, Chief? He said, five days ago. I said, that's too long. I'm gonna say all kinds of outrageous stuff. Just keep me on the phone. I'm gonna talk you up to home. I don't want you driving off the highway. So I started ranting and raving and talking about, oh my God, it was like four o'clock in the morning and people were on the radio talking about, you know, they want the cops dead and that. I said, oh my God, we've been set back. We're back before the rain. He says, no, Connie, I don't think it's that bad. I said, what are you talking about? He said, did you hear what happened to T, meaning Phil Tingarides? Then I said, well, I don't know what his lieutenant commander, who knows, I can't keep the ring straight. <laughs> I said, no, what happened to Phil? He said, no, 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 no. When, when the Nickerson, when the blood bounty hunters were, went on to Dorner's website and they were going down his kill list of the officers he intended to kill, the blood bounty hunters, the OGs were saying, yeah, well, yeah, we'll help him do that one. Yeah, yeah, this one, mm -hmm. yeah, we got, they got to Phil Tingariti's name. They said, oh, hell no. They went and dug up their guns. Duh, don't ask. <laughs> they buried their guns. They went and dug up their guns and they called Captain Tingarides, and they said, we're coming to your house to protect you. We don't want you dead. I told the chief I thought he was having a sleep deprivation hallucination because I didn't believe black gangsters anywhere in the cosmos would protect LAPD anything. And he said, go ask him. So I went down to Nick the next day, and I found some of the older guys, and I said, guys, you're tearing the, the space-time fabric. Tell me you did not offer to protect an LAPD captain, and they said, look, don't get it twisted. We still hate the blank and PD. But CSP, 
They helped my grandmother. They empowered the community to bring medical vans. When the principal said that Markham Middle School, Markham Middle School kids didn't have computers, they helped the community raise $300,000 and they brought laptops. When people's prescriptions run out, CSP helps find the money to fill them. They've made the parks safe, they made the pool safe, they made the library safe for my kids, and these are, these are gang members talking about their kids being safe. And they don't arrest us when we try to join summer night lights. We want CSP. So that's all I needed to know. That's just one anecdote. We also have other anecdotes. But the whole point of the evaluation and why we're able to be here today is because Dr. Georgia Leap volunteered to do this study. It is a rigorous study, over 2,000 contacts with uh, residents, focus groups, round, uh, interviews, individual as well as group surveys, uh, as well as rigorous analysis of the crime data. So not only the surprise about this program is that it increases trust, but it also reduces crime at a steeper rate. It wasn't created as a crime-fighting instrument. It was created as a, as, a, as a policy and a strategy for creating trust between police who are hated and by the community members who used to hate them. Can you create trust? Chief Beck said, can I create trust with the people who hate us the most? The answer is yes, but who knew? Trust is the best crime-fighting strategy. We have tons of anecdotes, but anecdotes do not do what a rigorous evaluation does. And I need you to know that the professors who did this evaluation under Dr. Leap's uh, leadership, they didn't take any money. We could only raise enough money to make sure that the research was done at a very high level. But they did this as a service because this program is so critical to the future of American policing. So we owe a great debt of gratitude. The city does. Uh, the funders stood up because they knew exactly what this meant. They had to save this program. And without an evaluation, you don't know what you have. So Dr. Leap, uh, uh, you know, you've been on this journey a long time. Uh, and uh, this evaluation is what makes this moment possible. And I want to thank you for, for your dedication and for the sacrifice that you made to do this. Thank you all. And uh, OK, OK, Chief. Chief Tingaridis, you're on. All right. <laughs> Georgia. <laughs> All right, the moment you've all been waiting for, the research, right? I am so incredibly grateful to all the people you see standing before you, Connie for her vision and her brilliance, the chief of police that was brave enough to say, he was brave enough to say, let the chips fall where they may, soon to be Deputy Chief Amata Tangarides, who was my guide through all of this. The council members here, Joe Buscaino is practically a member of the family. I don't know what I would do without him, without Marquise Harris Dawson. But there is a group that I must share gratitude with, and more than gratitude, the credit. And those are the residents of the two communities that my team spent a year with. This was not an evaluation hit and run. This was not a few weeks in the housing developments. We spent a year in Nickerson Gardens in Watts and in Ramona Gardens in Boyle Heights. And the residents were part of this evaluation from the first day. They helped us design questionnaires. And when we were going to ask questions that were irrelevant, they told us. They helped us pilot the questionnaires. They helped us find people. They helped us administer questionnaires, put together focus groups. And I will also add, they were paid. They did not do it voluntarily. They were paid for their time and their energy. And I can tell you, they allowed us into their homes. They allowed us into their lives. And they explained what they thought and what they felt, not only about the Community Safety Partnership, but about policing in Los Angeles. We are grateful to them. We are indebted to them. And more than anything, this evaluation was about community voice. Yes, there were crime statistics. And yes, Connie Rice is right. We were surprised to see that crime fell to an even lower level in the CSP zones than it did throughout the city. But that was not our intention. 
Our intention in this study was to raise community voice. We also want it to serve as a model for the future. The community must evaluate the LAPD. The community's voice needs to be heard. Chief Moore is responding to that voice in fulfilling one of our multiple recommendations that he create a CSP Bureau and selecting soon-to-be Deputy Chief Amata Tingarides was truly a vote and an understanding of the community voice. Now, everyone needs to understand that while the evaluation was positive about CSP, it also was not a love letter. There are 45 separate recommendations, and no, I'm not going to go into them now, thank God, okay? But I will tell you, I am grateful when the chief says it's going to be a blueprint, and yes, we are going to hold his feet to the fire. Not only me, not only the people you see arrayed before him, but the community. Because in both Nickerson Gardens and Ramona Gardens, the community put us on notice and said, we want policing, but we want a different kind of policing. We want CSP, but we want it to be participatory and accountable. I love what soon-to-be Chief Tingariti said when she talked about the Watts Rams, that now the community is leading the Watts Rams. That is our model, that the LAPD CSP is serving and enlarging the community, and the community is in charge of its own fate. This is a great day. This is the first of many. And really, it is embodied in the name of this initiative, which is truly the Community Safety Partnership. As we think about those words, and we think about Chief Tingarides, I'm just going to say it, going forward, we all hope and believe this truly marks the transformation of the LAPD and the City of Los Angeles. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. <laughs> one hour and one minute later, are there any questions? Um, this question is from Claudia Pasciuta mm -hmm. from CanX. Um, how many officers are going to be assigned to this new bureau, and how are you going to reassign resources and funding? And before I get to answer it, I want to, uh, people to understand, because I think there's been some misperceptions. This is with existing resources, existing resources of the Los Angeles Police Department budget. But with that, uh, Chief, for a month. Yep. So each of the sites has 10 officers plus supervision. So we're just over 100 personnel are in the nine existing sites. And, and the, uh, they'll be assigned all within the same bureau. And the effort of this is to ensure that resources at each of those programs are dedicated to those, uh, to those, to those programs and not pulled away in a time of scant resources where there are, uh, there are gaps in, as we move forward. Uh, this is going to ensure that those resources are not pulled for, uh, for, cont uh, for uh, other needs that are in contest with this. But that's one aspect of it. The other aspect that's critical is that the Community Safety Partnership envisions, the Bureau envisions, how else do we go about policing on the other functions that we look around the table today from a mindset of enforcement? And we need to look more towards a mindset of a shared responsibility and a reallocating and a, re, and a movement to other city departments. And I believe real, a real opportunity is neighborhood and non-government entities that can fill in a gap for issues of mental health, homelessness, outreach and engagement, social programs that right now is a 911 number. So this is an example of what happens when we have officers in a neighborhood that have serious and underlying issues of, of, of safety and, and trust in government that we can come in with a long-term strategy of, of helping muster resources to fix that, which ultimately means less, less police officers are needed for the various functions that today are being called upon to do. This is from Eric Leonard of NBC. Um, 
So CSP depends a lot on personal relationships between the officers and the community. Um, so how are you going to scale that up? Hi, Cindy. Um, I, I think that the community dictates that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that the community uh, dictates that. Um, what's really critical in the CSP model, it's a relationship-based policing. So it's easy to work with the people that have a positive relationship, that speak positive about the police. It's very difficult to work with the people who have a negative perception of police. Part of the success of CSP is trying to build relationships with those individuals that do not trust and have a lack of understanding. It does two things. It teaches the officer how to understand and, and be aware of why that person does not have trust for law enforcement. And then the other side is for that person who doesn't have trust to understand where the officer's heart or compassion and work ethic is coming from. So relationships are fragile. As we work through this and attempt to build relationships with those that don't like us and those that do, that's the bread and butter of what this program's about. The officers are walking footbeats daily. They're attending the resident advisory council dis, uh, meetings. They're working with the uh, housing authority managers. The managers within the public housing developments, Nickerson Gardens is 1,056 units. And within those units, you have anywhere from three to six family members living. That is several thousand community members that may not even know about CSP. Our goal is to get to those families, to build those relationships, to identify what they need to be successful, to increase the quality of life issues in those communities, and address the conflict by working with our crisis intervention and gang intervention workers for a holistic approach to solving the community concerns. limit it to one more question. Um, I, I just have to leave after one, but you can continue. So okay. If you want to um, I mean, there are some questions from reporters that are not related to CSP, so I'm not going to okay. get to those we'll, we'll if I just have one more. We'll yeah. Um, so, uh, John Rigardi from LA Magazine, um, he wants to know um, the UCLA study, um, what role did that play in your decision to expand CSP? And what specifically um, about the recommendations are you going to um, be targeting to implement? So one of the things that I'm proud that we've done in Los Angeles is we don't just kind of find slogans or we don't just say this is a pilot. We try to embed successful programs into uh, the very structures and the overall policies and foundations of our departments. Uh, certainly this was what happened when we started something that was summer night lights that turned into gang reduction youth development work. Uh, certainly this is something that we've seen in all sorts of task force that we've set up inside the department but then fundamentally become a part of what this department is. I think the strongest recommendation in there was get not just a foothold in, which we've had with CSP programs, but now instead of looking at this as a segregated off part of this department, put it in as a bureau so that in the same way that we have training, um, helping all police officers keep up with training and stay uh, connected with the best practices. This is the same thing with community-based policing. Oftentimes, departments structure community policing as just the community relations side of things or maybe those um, officers in a given geographic division who will do those work in that meeting. This now says this is a value straight through all divisions and straight through the entire department that has a role in training. And so I think that strongest uh, recommendation of creating the Bureau is what you see here today. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail in there on the other uh, 47 recommendations. And I think each one of those are things that now that we have a deputy chief, we don't have to have it be outsiders coming in and asking a department. It can be something the department gets to write itself. So I'm going to leave this in the hands of Chairwoman Rodriguez to, for the rest of it. Um, and my apologies after the lead a meeting. Thank you, everybody, for being a part of this, and feel free to continue with the questions. There's much smarter people than me to answer them. So. <laughs> I hand you the spray. Are there any other CSP questions? Um, yeah, these are not related to CSP. There's just uh, a few, whoops, a few more. Um, let's see. 
Uh, Liz Cho from LA Daily News. Um, this is about the bridge home shelters. Um, how much is, does it cost to do extra enforcement around those zones, um, whether it's Sanitation Park Department, LAPD, or anyone else? Uh, and what's your position on the zones uh, since some activists are launching a campaign against them? Well, I can allow the chief to elaborate on the uh, policing efforts, but uh, frankly, my understanding is, is that there's been substantial decreases in the cost. Uh, I know in, uh, in my area, in, in Pacoima, uh, the emergency winter shelter that we had, we, uh, because of the uh, enforcement activation that we did in that area, some of the rules in terms of when people can arrive and, uh, and leave, we actually saw a tremendous decrease in the costs uh, related to sanitation. But I'll let the chief discuss any uh, expenditures and costs associated with the police department. Very apt at that. So the, uh, when the Bridge Home Program first began, we dedicated resources 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the safety zone. And over the last year, uh, two years uh, plus, that number of bridge home sites has grown. It's grown even beyond the 15 that were initially envisioned and now are, are, are creating a number of locations throughout the city. And so we're shifting gears because this last year it was going to be $8.6 million worth of funding that would be required to dedicate resources there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And frankly, the city just simply does not have that money to provide this department. And so we're shifting also because we don't think that's the best use of overtime. So we're applying a sector uh, relationship using senior leads as well as with the local command to understand where that location is at, uh, what the challenges, if there are any. A number of these locations have actually opened and have been very successful in not creating undesired or, or, uh, or negative impacts on the surrounding community. But we are certainly mindful of that potential and working with the uh, Bridge Home contractor as as a reminder each of those sites has 24 hours a day seven day a week security they have professional staffing that is there they have added sanitation services and city services to ensure that the addition of these housing uh, resource uh, house homeless individuals that are now given shelter and a bridge home is not having an adverse impact on that community thank you Okay, this is the last uh, set of questions. Um, it's from uh, Lexis Olivia Ray uh, of LA Taco, and it's all uh, related to protests. Um, one is, uh, what is the mayor doing to prevent federal officers uh, from coming to LA and mistreating uh, protesters, and will LAPD be held to those same standards? Yeah. So, uh, in fairness to the Chair of Public Safety, I want to take this one. Uh, I actually, this was actually a conversation today at uh, the mayor's cabinet meeting. Uh, over the weekend, I had a conversation with the U.S. Attorney, uh, Nick Hanna, as well as with the head of the FBI, uh, and we've had earlier conversations with our other federal partners. Uh, the uh, security of federal buildings here in Los Angeles is, is, are safe. These buildings are safe, they're secure, they're protected. We saw the uh, actions of a few of individuals that did vandalize and did assault some federal courthouses, three buildings, as well as our headquarters. And we worked alongside uh, some very brave uh, individuals of federal, from the Federal Protection Services at those sites, as well as line personnel from the FBI, ATF, and others uh, that rallied to ensure that those sites were protected. Uh, and our own officers stood and withstood uh, tremendous assaults. And I'm proud of their work in repelling those that were bent, hell-bent on violence on those sites. And what we saw was uh, that that was isolated to Saturday night. We saw yesterday protests that did not devolve into violence, did not have instances of property damage or attacks against police officers. The city is safe. Our effort in maintaining its safety is working with protesters in a manner that facilitates the First Amendment right to ensure that they are able to express themselves and that they uh, conduct themselves lawfully, but also conduct themselves in a nonviolent manner. Should that change and when that change, I believe that uh, the local resources are more than ample uh, to deal with those challenges and will continue to do so. We welcome the federal law enforcement agencies 
uh, support of us in reduction of gang violence and reduction particularly of gun violence. This last, uh, last few months we've seen a resurgence in the level of gun violence and we welcome again our federal partners uh, to identify those that are preying upon others and exacting that violence and I know that we have their full commitment in that regard. Thank you. Um, so how are the reforms that you're discussing um, address allegations that officers are harassing and otherwise mistreating women, trans, and non-binary people so, during mass arrests? So um, let me do this. I've got okay. a lot of people being held here. Yeah. Can I handle these with you instead of with sure, all sure, this? Sure. That would be great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you very much.